Secrets and Spies presents Espresso Martini with Chris Carr and Matt Fulton. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Espresso Martini. Matt, how are you? I'm doing good. We're really living up to our name uh, this morning, for me anyway. <laughs> We're uh, yes. recording at a particularly early hour for a few reasons. Well, actually, you're doing me um, a huge favor by doing this today and not yesterday. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's very early here. It is, yeah, yeah, I apologize about that. I'm, I'm a few hours away from getting a tooth extracted, so... Uh... That's yeah. why we're recording. We were both recording a bit late and a bit early, so uh, we don't usually record on a Friday. So, well, today is a jam-packed episode, and one story we're covering might even have a developing angle to it now. So the first story we're looking at is a Russian operative who was arrested in France who may, uh, who's alleged to have plans to disrupt the Olympics. And as we um, are recording this, there's obviously been reports of arson attacks at French train stations on the network, which is causing massive delays. So um, we're keeping an eye on that story as we're going through the podcast. So you may or may not get an update as as more information comes through. Um, Then after the Russian operative, we're going to be looking at details of the failed assassination attempt against former President Donald Trump, who was on the campaign trail. And then we're going to look a little bit at President Biden, who stepped aside and out of the presidential race and put forward Kamala Harris as his potential um, replacement. So um, we will get started with the uh, Russian operative story. So Matt, I'll kind of go into the details mm-hmm. and then we'll, we'll come back to you for your thoughts. So um, we're taking information from an article from The Insider by Michael Weiss, who's one of our kind of regulars, <laughs> not, not in person, but just virtually. So the key points are um, a Russian operative named Kirill Grazanov, uh, a Russian lawyer turned chef, was directed by Russian intelligence services, the FSB and GRU, to stage large-scale destabilization acts at the opening of the Olympic Games in Paris, which is going to be tonight. So French security services arrested Grazanov on July 19th at his Paris home. He was found with diplomatic material and charged with espionage. And four days, uh, yeah, he was charged with espionage four days after his arrest. And he is facing up to 30 years in prison if convicted. The arrest occurred just as the Olympics were about to start in Paris, where there have been extensive security efforts, including tens of thousands of police deployed and a million individuals will be screened for entry to the most secure games venues. The Associated Press reports that 5,000 individuals have been prohibited from the Olympics, and with a fifth of those people suspected of espionage, as stated by the Fr- France's interior minister. The Olympics were indeed Grasnov's target, according to a joint investigation by the insider Le Monde and Der Spiegel. He told his FSB superior two months ago, we will have an opening ceremony like no other. Grezanov revealed his plans during a drunken conversation in Bulgaria, which is not great for OPSEC, by the way. No. Which led to his arrest. (laughs) Um, And uh, he is known to have extensive ties to the FSB and GRU. And he obviously bragged about his mission to disrupt the Olympics, which was a bit of a stupid thing to do. Grezanov, he trained at the Le Cordon Bleu in Paris and worked in haute cuisine for over a decade and used his chef persona as cover for his intelligence activities. His glamorous lifestyle and social media presence contrasted sharply with his covert operation. Um, His email and travel patterns shows direct ties to Russian special services and his cover identity and background resemble those of other Russian operatives, suggesting a carefully orchestrated cover for his spy activities. French authorities were already on high alert due to other Russian provocations and terrorist operations linked to France's support for Ukraine, and security measures for the Olympics are extensive with significant efforts to prevent foreign interference. And as we just stated earlier at the beginning, with this arson attack in France, uh, which is a developing story, there may or may not be a connection to to this uh, Russian operation, but only time will tell. So, Matt, I will hand over to you. Let me know what you what your thoughts are on all of this. Yeah, well, this is a really interesting story. 
I mean, by the time this episode is out, the opening ceremonies will mm-hmm. have already happened and aired. So yeah. chances you folks listening know a bit more <laughs> than we do at the moment. Yes. But there have been concerns for months about the security situation around the Olympics, whether that's through ISIS or or groups related to the war in Gaza, or of course, Russian attempts to sabotage the games to to some extent. There was a there was a story that we had previously covered about Russian bots and everything trying to spread like misinformation about the games, trying to scare people away, et cetera. Yeah. Trying to just sort of just, yeah. just rain on the parade. You know? This is really interesting. The issue with the with the high speed rail lines that were sabotaged as of this morning, um, some sort of arson attack details, and as like you said, as we were recording, um, details about this are really scarce. We don't really have much evidence at all as to who was responsible. I do think it's worth saying though that the tactics, like the arson attacks and stuff, are broadly in line with other incidents of Russian link sabotage that we've seen across the defense industrial base in Europe targeted at. European countries supplying weapons to Ukraine, right? So it just feels very similar. It doesn't mean it necessarily has to be the Russians, right? But I mean, this, um, I don't know, this certainly feels in line with with what the Russians were planning to do. I find it, it interesting that this guy who was arrested was so kind of just blatant. And I don't know, like, when the Russians send their people, they're not really sending their best right now. Like you have no. this guy like getting, you know, fall down drunk in um, at the airport mm. in uh, Istanbul and missing his flight because of it. Like he literally couldn't he literally couldn't get on his flight. Oh, I know. That was unbelievable. He was so drunk that he couldn't get on the plane. I mean, I don't know what his appointment was supposed to be the other side. But and then and then he went off on a two day bender at his uh, retreat somewhere on the Black Sea. So it's like, yeah, like super spy. This, <laughs> what a crazy this is man. not, you know, mm. I don't know. But no. at the same point, it certainly shows a a clear willingness of the Russians to to disrupt these games to some extent. Uh, and again, I would say we us uh, sitting here recording this, we don't really know much at all concrete about these um, arson attacks. Uh, maybe it could be that this is it for the day and the games go off without a hitch, or at least, you know, the opening ceremony goes off without a hitch. Maybe at some point in a couple hours in the fingers future, crossed, yeah. there's, yeah, fingers crossed, mm. there is more sitting here right now. We don't know. The whole idea of these games in Paris to center them around the middle of the city, right along the Seine, it's an incredibly ambitious plan, at least visually appealing, dramatic from the standpoint of, you know, having the games in the middle of the city. I understand what they're trying to do, but it just seems like a security nightmare. You know, like I saw oh, yeah, a piece, yeah. um, I think it was on CNN that I was watching yesterday. It was a piece about they mentioned all of the like thousands of apartments that overlook this section of the Seine and the efforts that they went through to like vet everyone who lives in these apartments and like to, you know, check their details and everything. It just seems like I, I it, it seems to me like the kind of efforts that you would have in DC around like a presidential uh inauguration, you know, just completely locked down the center of the city, nothing moves until the thing is over. The difference is a presidential inauguration, at least to that extent, the security situation lasts for a couple hours. This lasts for about mm. like two weeks, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it yeah, just seems crazy. extraordinarily yeah. difficult to try to keep this thing going forward without any kind of a significant disruption. You know, as we've seen in um, the bombing in uh, Centennial Park during the Atlanta Olympics back in the um, 90s, right? That didn't, it's remembered as an attack on the Olympic Games, even though where that bombing happened wasn't anywhere sort of near the Olympic villages, you know, and I think in something previously that we'd said about about the games, you know, we brought up like, you don't have to attack like the Olympic village itself to be considered mm. a disruption of the games to some extent. It just yeah. seems, yeah. it just seems like an impossible situation that the French are are working with. So I don't envy them at all. Of course, you know, Yesterday, it was reported that the Belgians um, arrested seven suspects on terrorism charges uh, across the country. I don't know if it's confirmed that there was specifically linked to the Olympics or 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 who they arrested, if that's, you know, an ISIS kind of geared threat or if it's, you know, the Russians or something. We're not really sure about that right now. But there are mm-hmm. no shortage mm-hmm. of people out there with the means and the resources mm-hmm. to um, 
to uh, disrupt this thing. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, I mentioned this on the previous episode, we talk about the potential disruptions. Um, you know, France has been on the front line um, with jihadist inspired terrorism for many years now. And yeah, just I, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I'm sort of just holding my breath for the next few weeks while the Olympic goes Olympics goes on hoping nothing happens. Yeah. Because because um, internationally, there's a lot of tensions, obviously, um, Ukraine, and we've got the Israel Gaza situation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously, then that brings up memories of the Munich Olympics. And yeah. I don't know if you heard about there was a scandal involving Adidas trainers recently, where um, Adidas had hired a a Palestinian model to to model these trainers that were supposed to be for the 1972 Olympics. And a lot of people were pissed off about that because it seemed quite insensitive. That's pretty tone deaf at best. Yeah, them. exactly. Yeah. And and my fear a little bit has been because the, you remember that the, the um, we talked about the cyber operation that was going on for Russia. They were kind of using imagery connected to Hamas, uh, Black September and the PLO. Right. So it kind of was echoing you know, um, extremism of the past. And I just have been a bit concerned that we may see some sort of some, yeah, I don't know, there could be some sort of attack that has uh, what appears to have an Islamist angle, but Mm -hmm. may actually be uh, something directed by Russia. And it's interesting that they've been recruiting Moldovans to do a lot of the, should we say, the dirty work. Apparently, you know, Moldovans are uh, cheap and easy to recruit, according to the article. Like the new Bulgarians. um, yeah, yeah, and uh, Grazanov was was basically recruiting Moldovans for whatever we because we don't really know the details of what he was planning to do, right? But so there might well be you know sort of cells of Moldovans were already set up to do something, and this um, arson attack could well be it. Hopefully not, but it could be. It's difficult to say at this time because we don't really know. But the other interesting thing with Grazanov was his. You know, his cover as a chef, this is the second time recently. I mean, obviously, we've had Prigozhin was a chef at one time. Um, and then we had this suspect called Vitaly Kovalev, who was apprehended in Orlando, and he was arrested for speeding. And he was linked to the Havana syndrome incidents that have been affecting US personnel. And he featured in that um, 60 Minutes documentary earlier this year. So he was the Russian who was in the high speed chase and arrested at the side of the road, if you remember that. And he was captured with this electronic device that um, could wipe the, ele- uh, yeah, the electrics of his car and the other device in his proximity. And he, his cover was a chef and he even appeared on a tv show as a chef it was a top um, chef I not think. too dissimilar something yeah. like that yeah, yeah not too dissimilar yeah to this other guy because he's Weird. all i had a quick look at his instagram and it was all sort of uh food porn and things like that and him traveling places going to lavish places so there seems to be this new thing of these sort of russians hiding in plain sight but just sort of a outwardly so they don't cover up the fact that they have a russian connection they outwardly are uh you know pursuing something like being a chef or a social media influencer uh but by night they seem to be up to you know no good on behalf of the russians and there's just something very interesting there so should we be concerned about russian chefs now <laughs> seriously if i you was know, a russian chef and didn't crazy. have anything to do with the gru or the yeah. fsb i'd feel pretty nervous right yeah. now like uh yeah yeah guys. exactly oh i know I know. So it's crazy. And with the Moldovan thing as well, what was interesting earlier this year, um, some Moldovans were arrested for painting stars of David across Paris amidst the sort of heightened tensions of the Hamas Israel war. And they had links to the Russian intelligence services, apparently. And not long ago, well, in 2012, there was a Moldovan, Moldovan assassin who shot a banker in London who had ties to the Russian and Moldovian mafia. So you know, Moldova is definitely one to keep an eye on now with regards to some of this stuff that's going mm. on. Um, they definitely are being exploited by the Russian intelligence services for their for their bidding. And then with Grezanov as well, the interesting other thing was that his connection to there's this other unit known as 29155, who are kind of the GRU assassination squad. And Grezanov seems to share the same driver, a man named Andre. Cheganov, he lives in the same building as a man named Denis Sergeev, who is off Unit 29155, which is the GRU assassination squad. They both live in this building called Zorg 36 in Moscow. And um, Sergeev commanded the botched operation that, uh, to poison Sergei and Yulia Skripal in Salisbury in 2018. So it's kind of interesting 
that uh yeah that there's this sort of like almost kevin bacon like two step remove from the uh the salisbury poisoning so with this character so yeah so it's just a very dark and murky links a lot of these sort of russian operatives abroad are slowly getting exposed and um and as you mentioned with his drunken behavior we hardly got the top crop of russian operatives no, at like the it's moment. just it's just sloppy it's unprofessional like what yeah. are you yeah why would yeah, you it's so why would you do weird. that yeah it's so bizarre and the fact that a so-called professional intelligence service would allow would not be aware of him being like that i mean ex-girlfriends have publicly shamed him online for his alcohol issues and obviously he was a heavy drinker among his colleagues i mean i know there is a heavy drinking culture within russia so maybe it just was has been normalized but i haven't seen how it affects him professionally until now i don't know but i mean i did many many about 2 years ago a guest on on this podcast we were just talking off air and he was just sort of saying that in regards to a lot of the um russian officers connected to like sort of sleeper operations and and these kind of infiltrations of the west are just not as good as they used to be he even said that he was sort of uh, former connected to mi6 and stuff so it's it's all very yeah. interesting I mean, I think if if a CIA officer fit this same description, this same sort of drunken vodka soaked vibe, mm, right, mm, and got arrested mm. in a in a country disrupting an operation potentially, the director of the CIA would get hauled in front of Congress. Like it would be a it would be a, a huge issue. Like how how? Yeah. The other thing too, like mm. you consider the the cover for this guy, and then the other guy, the other chef that we talked about, who was connected to the to the um, Havana syndrome stuff, purportedly. These are covers that don't seem to withstand more than a few seconds of concerted scrutiny. I mean, this information that we're talking about here comes from, you know, the crew at the Insider and Der Spiegel and Lamond. They're all using open source information, right? They're yeah, not an yeah, intelligence yeah. agency, a security service. And this is how quickly they're able to like fully pick this guy apart, you know? Yeah, well, Vitaly Kovalev, the guy in Orlando, he was a former GRU technical officer. It was all in his history. And then he immigrated to America. Yeah. Um, and I I am starting to wonder, <laughs> here's my pet theory, is there someone who's vetting some of these visas who's sympathetic to, should we say, Russia's sort of right-wing cause now because Russia positions itself in a right-wing way? Are there people in certain countries across the world who are in charge of sort of uh, – of vetting people for visas somehow in the pay of Russia because these people do seem to be quite obvious and I mean but and then or or okay I, I mean it's a bit conspiratorial that thinking or the other way is it's just people not looking hard enough anymore than they used to it's more of a very quick rubber stamping is it kind a of systematic thing. yeah you don't yeah, have the yeah. you don't have the mm. the staff like the State Department staff yeah. overseas to mm. conduct the interviews thoroughly to the extent that you would that you would yeah. want to. Yeah. I don't know that, but yeah, ten years ago, obviously, we we're in a slightly different world where a lot of people were thinking the Cold War's long over and Russia's not really a threat. So maybe some people were. I don't know. Maybe there was a sort of not a policy to scrutinize Russians. I'm sure they're being scrutinized a lot harder now than they were. But maybe 10 years ago, they weren't being scrutinized as much. Because, um, again, like with Anna Chapman, she was sort of hiding in plain sight. The only real thing with her, she had her one of her family members was like a senior member of one of the Russian intelligence services, which, again, had they been scrutinized properly, that would have been picked up. But because she went to America with her married name, Chapman, which was an English um yeah, she was married to an Englishman and took that surname. Did that surname kind of disrupt any sort of basic scrutiny? I don't know. There's just something gone wrong somewhere, certainly in the States, and until some spy scandal comes out here, and I can say in Britain too, but certainly in the States and in France, there's some sort of weird um, gap in, in their scrutinization of people. And for the States in particular, that surprises me because it is quite hard to want to immigrate to america um and you know depending on what visa you're going for you get a lot of scrutiny it is um, yeah and i'd be interested i just would be interested in a bit more about vitaly kovalev who was in the states about why 
he was granted a visa what was it about him because in the states it, depending on what visa you go for you've got to prove that you're not and you're um like a standout individual in your area that you aren't replacing an a, what it could be an american job basically you've mm-hmm. got to kind of demonstrate that your particular skills will allow you to come to america and, and so like being a chef makes sense being an actor is another one or a director if you can show that you've got a certain unique thing that's required by i don't know whoever your sponsor is then you'll get in uh or otherwise there's another visa where if you um you know a, a certain level of wealth and you aren't going to be a a burden on the united states you can get in that way but i'd be interested to know more about why some of these people are managing to get into the states in the way they are um i think there's a bigger issue there which should be looked at definitely yeah um, i just i just think back to if you know the crew at the insider and these other you know press outlets mm-hmm. and stuff if they can pick apart this guy's identity very quickly with just open source information it should not be a trouble for you know intelligence services for the FBI, you know, et cetera, to do the same. Very, very strange here. I mean, I also think back to maybe linking it back to these, um, to these, uh, fires on these, um, high speed lines in France, you know, some of the, the bot discussion centered around the games that we discussed previously, it seemed to be geared more towards stoking fear in people to stay away from the games. Right. And then you look at, okay, the four major, high speed rail lines leading into Paris were the ones that were disrupted that physically prevents people from reaching Paris today, the day of the opening ceremony, right? Puts a damper on the games. They are both both of those data points that I just mentioned are in line with the same objective, which again, I mean, when this is out tomorrow we'll likely know more, but right now, I mean, it yeah, it like yeah. I think Occam's razor is Russians. Oh yeah, there's a lot of prestige around the Olympics and I think Putin's annoyed that obviously the Russians are officially banned from the Olympics. Sure. And so if he can embarrass the French by having a, you know, lots of rows of empty seats on camera, I think he would be happy. Sure. Because it, it it will make the Olympics look like they're not very important, which right. then will make Putin feel less aggrieved. You know, it's typically what people do who are not invited to a party. They try and poo-poo the party and make yeah. it feel less relevant so they feel better. Um, so, you know, I, mean, I know who will be tuning in tonight. It'll be Vladimir Putin just to yeah. see how well things have gone. So I suspect I, I, I'll put money on. I would put a cup on, a, a Secrets of Spies cup on that this is the Russians. <laughs> In some way, fair. probably via Moldovians or some other cutout. But I suspect when all is said and done, we will find some either GRU or FSB link to what's happened um, with this uh, arson attack. Could be completely wrong. I'm really curious to see if if this is if this is the extent of it, or if there are more mm. issues in, let's say, the cyber domain around the games or stuff, or like something to like disrupt the broadcasts. That occurred yeah. to me too, because like when when this guy said, you know, oh, there's going to be an opening ceremony like no other. I don't think the Russians would do something kinetic to the opening ceremony. I don't think they're nearly that stupid. But well, they, yeah, 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 yeah. They definitely run into a. They did something kinetic. They run into a getting into Article Five territory. Not yeah, no, it's literally an act of war that. if you start shooting people at yeah. the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. Yeah. But um, you can imagine, so I'm just seeing some footage now of um, workers on the railway repairing what looks like cables and stuff. Mm. Um, So, uh, yeah, I mean, what could happen? (laughs) Um, Do you remember remember that scene in Skyfall where I think Em's in a car and she looks at her laptop? She and her colleague are looking at something on the laptop and then suddenly something happens in the screen and then this sort of like skull figure appears on the screen and all these things... Oh going yeah, on. that's in the whole montage the, uh, where uh, Vauxhall Cross got blown yeah. up, right? That's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's just before that, and then the building blows up. Mm-hmm. Could we see something on those lines with the Olympic broadcast? Well, suddenly the signal get interrupted, like you were saying, and we see I don't know some sort of Russian propaganda thing connected to like Ukraine or something like that. If I were sitting in the yeah. GRU, disrupting the broadcast would be something that I think would be feasible and have a high mm. return mm. on investment. If I wanted to embarrass Macron yeah. and 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 the French and disrupt 
disrupt the games, that would be something that I would look yeah, to quite yeah. quite strongly. Yeah, and it's sort of like, um, as you say, it doesn't really harm anybody. It just embarrasses people. Yeah. And it'll probably, you know, and it'll probably be done in such a way where you can't completely tell it's Russia either. But um, so I guess, I don't know, if you see a lot of uh, <laughs> Russian embassies around the world tonight tuning in at like the time for the Olympics, <laughs> we might need to, I don't know, if you see all the lights on the embassy, yeah. might want to keep an eye well, I think out. It, so I don't know, who it knows? Airs, um, I saw the opening mm. ceremony starts one thirty. Mm. Uh, in the afternoon eastern time here so that's that's only here. yeah that's only a couple hours away so mm. we will we yeah. will know you might shortly. be editing this i will probably you might be, be editing this as i it, will as be on the couch editing this <laughs> literally and it's like oh and shit. Thinking, shit okay and chris is still hopped up on <laughs> painkillers from his tooth extracting yeah, uh yeah, what yeah. do we do <laughs> i know i don't have the ability to speak in a few hours so i'm like i might have to just do use uh, chat GTP Just to go up and respond Get for you, you on but... with like bloody gauze <laughs> falling out of your mouth. Yeah, yeah with the robotic voice. Uh-huh. But uh, I, I, joking aside, because we don't know what might, hopefully yes. nothing terrible yeah, happens. Yeah, this could age poorly knows, when we're joking. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, God, there might be some atrocity and people die or something, which I hope not. But uh, obviously edit this out. <laughs> Yes, um, but uh, maybe I'll wait till yeah, after yeah, the opening so, ceremony to decide if we to see which which version. To, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'll do like oh, a real God. somber take next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh God, yeah, you could do three scenarios. Uh-huh. Could do, but yeah, that would yeah. do that. Oh God. But anyway, so I yeah, so with the the sabotage, I do suspect there might be a Russian connection to all of this. Um and we will see. Time will tell. And I and I hope the Olympic ceremony, the opening ceremony and the Olympics themselves go without a hitch, but I, I'm worried that something's gonna happen. And I think you're right. I suspect it, you know. It might well be um, not kinetic. It will be more cyber. Um, mm-hmm. So, but and, and allegedly, actually, with the rail attack, um, we'll call it attack. There was supposedly reports of some cyber element to it as well, but I haven't seen anything significant. And just looking at the cables now, to be honest with you, that is a very. Um, so it's been painted as an arson attack, which it obviously was. And when you I think when somebody uses the word arson, I suddenly see buildings on fire. I see backdraft, yeah. whatever, you know. And I'm just looking at an image of the cable now. And frankly, if it only takes what I'm seeing to cause such level of disruption, I think we might need to think about how to protect cables better. Because fr- what I'm seeing is an image of a block of black cables. Uh, it's on the BBC website. And it's a block of black cables. And they're just slightly, they're just burned it looks like somebody's put a little fire next to them right and it's just slightly burned through these cables it almost looks like as if cables had overheated yeah almost is is the sort of level of damage i'm looking at here so yeah that that's very low level essentially something this wasn't an act of sabotage i haven't seen anything to suggest anything like that but earlier this week on the northeast corridor for amtrak here they had a, a disruption between i think it was between dc and new york where um uh, power lines fell onto the tracks and stuff and yeah shut down rail service between dc and new york for a few hours again that wasn't i don't believe i haven't seen anything indicating that that was anything other than just you know an accident a normal kind of maintenance issue or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. um but it shows how how easy it is to disrupt mm, mm. a rail line like that on a day like today when you yeah. would figure it'd be used yeah. a lot yeah well uh two years ago i had to do a course in leeds and i i made the decision because it, because we have so many rail strikes etc and mm-hmm. I, i'm one of these people i will if i'm going to be in another city that's quite far away at a especially at 9 a.m in the morning yeah. and to get from leeds to london i think it's nearly two and a half hours so i'm not going to go that day i'm going to go the night before which is what i did and anyway i'm glad i did that because the next morning a few uh, classmates were late because they were taking the train up from london or they were going to and had to drive in the end the re- and the trains were delayed and disrupted because people were stealing copper from the lines. Mm. And that's a problem in the UK where people steal metals from the lines and sell the metal on. And, and we've had a lot of that in the last few years. Um, so again, I think like, yeah, the rail networks need to be slightly better protected, especially vital cables like that. Yeah, I mean, are they, uh, I can't quite tell whether they're supposed to be it looked okay. There are some kind of concrete slabs next to them that could cover the cables. So maybe this photograph's a bit misleading. Um, uh, but still, it's yeah. I don't know. It just seems a bit too easy to cause such a level of disruption. So, yeah. 
that's that's yeah my 10 pennies worth well matt i'll hand over to you because you've got this uh obviously the failed assassination attempt against former president donald trump which has been sort of doing a news quite a large news cycle and that happened just after we aired our our previous episode so it we did. had a good sort of two weeks i think to look at all this so yeah yeah i had a friend of the pod of course um jacob ware come on shortly after mm-hmm. the um assassination so. attempt to do a whole kind of breakdown on the issue of political violence in the election and his sort of analysis of of the assassination assassination attempt itself. That is, I believe, the episode right above this one in folks' feed if they haven't heard it already. So go check that out. There's like a whole lot more about that than here. But in this one, um, we're working from a, a group of, of articles that cover various parts of this that all could have summarized all together and stuff. But there's definitely a lot more context and details in those articles that I encourage um, listeners to go check out. So here's a couple key points here. On July 13th, during a rally in Butler, PA, 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks attempted to assassinate former President Trump, killing one person in the rally and injuring several others. Trump, of course, I'm sure almost everyone listening knows this, but was apparently grazed by a bullet or potentially, according to the FBI director, a piece of glass or other kind of shrapnel. Trump claims it was a bullet that grazed his ear, but... Anyway, Crooks had searched for information on JFK's assassination and registered for the rally a week prior. He then visited the rally site multiple times and overflew it with a drone on the day of the shooting. The FBI is still investigating his motive and background, noting his use of encrypted apps and possession of crude explosives. Crooks was flagged for suspicious behavior and using a rangefinder by local police and a counter sniper before firing at Trump. Despite the Secret Service being alerted 19 minutes prior, Crooks fired shortly after Trump began speaking. Analysis from veteran snipers and a former Secret Service agent suggests that the counter-sniper teams likely overlooked crooks due to their focus on distant threats and highlighted security lapses, including the lack of rooftop surveillance and drones and a breakdown in communication with local law enforcement. The ongoing investigations will review the counter-sniper team's actions and leadership decisions with potential consequences for those found negligent. So here's an important point here that I want to highlight so in the war zone article that we've included here, they interview um, yeah a couple uh, former snipers and stuff to like get their breakdown of this. They noted how shortly before Crooks opened fire, there's other people that were sort of in the area of this building, kind of spotted him and were calling out to cops like, "Yo, he's got a gun yeah. right there, right?" Yeah. And then on the video, you can see the counter sniper team sort of like adjust and looking in that direction. So of course the thought was like, "Why didn't you just take the guy out?" You know, like right there, why did a couple minutes go past and then he starts shooting, right? It was suggested that the counter sniper teams were looking beyond that building into the roof line and the other windows and stuff and not seeing him closer in the foreground. So, I mean, there'll be several investigations about this. We'll get to the bottom of exactly what happened, but that's potentially the answer as to why they did not fire on him immediately. They were looking past him at something else, right? And using scopes and binoculars with a limited field of view. So this is the other problem, isn't it? Right. Um, The Secret Service also didn't have drones overhead during the rally, which of course would probably make it easier to spot him on the roof line. The incident has raised questions about security failures and miscommunication with Republicans and Democrats in Congress grilling Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheadle at a hearing this week. Cheadle resigned the following day after the chairman and ranking member of the House Oversight Committee called for her to to resign. I think Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, did as well. So she was gone quickly. Um, Investigations by the Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General and a potential House investigation have been announced to address security lapses and lack of transparency. And... um, I believe there was a call between Mike Johnson and Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader of the House, and it was decided, like, at least from what Mike Johnson said, like he wants this to be like a serious thing, not like a partisan yeah. food fight. So I think w- we will get to the bottom of this in a pretty productive way. The Secret Service arm responsible for protecting top officials is nearly 10% smaller than a decade ago, despite budget yeah. increases and a rise in political violence in the country. Chronic understaffing, competition from the private sector, and growing protection demands have strained the agency's resources and personnel. The agency faces increased threats and retention challenges exacerbated by historical scandals and a slow-moving hiring process. 
Chris, what do you think? Oh, God, lots of thoughts on all of this. First of all, I'll just say, like many people, I was shocked that a would-be assassin would get so close to a former US president and manage to take a shot. And it is obviously a terrible failure of security on multiple fronts, and we will find out more in time exactly what were the causes of all that. Um, so I've got I got multiple thoughts. I'll I'll do my first round, then I'll come back and then let you say what you want to say, and then and then I'm, I'm, maybe my other thoughts might become relevant or unrelevant. I don't know. But the government himself, so Thomas Matthew Crooks, we always seem to with would be assassins or assassins always seem to um, use their middle name, don't we? We do. That <laughs> it's is sort serial of weird. killers. Yeah, yeah, it's so weird. Yeah. It's so weird. So, uh, but anyway, so yeah, so Thomas Matthew Crooks. So look look into his history. So he was described as quiet and academic. And apparently he was a victim, a victim of bullying, um, allegedly over his body odor and wearing camouflage hunting gear to school and surgical face masks, both during and after COVID. So he used to get a lot of sort of stick for all that. His internet history has revealed that he looked into details of the JFK assassination just days before. He was particularly interested in how far yeah. Oswald was from Kennedy. Then also he looked into upcoming events with both Trump and Biden, indicating that he was less motivated by who the target was, but more about the reaction from who he was targeting, if that makes sense. So I think he was looking more for the for the fame uh, and notoriety than actually who he was trying to kill. It's a bit like that. Um, the kind of the uh, natural born killers type thing of the 90s, if you remember that movie by... Sure. Uh, What's his name? <laughs> I forgot his name. Guy directed JFK, uh, Oliver Stone. Oliver, yeah, Oliver Stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Directed by Oliver Stone. So where those killers were looking for notoriety and stuff. And I think, um, you know, that certainly with the mass shootings in the nineties, which were thankfully quite rare, there did seem to be this sort of thing where bullied people were looking to somehow become big and important by committing a terrible atrocity so there's sort of some pop psychology in there for you with that so and as you mentioned you know crooks had been flagged a few times there's even body cam camera footage of two police officers and a secret service agent standing over his body after the fact and they discussed because they're looking at a mobile phone and there's a series of photographs of people who've been flagged and he's one of them and they confirm in the discussion oh yeah he was he was flagged he's one of the guys you know and also in that brilliant article by the war zone with the two snipers there's some really interesting real-time video embedded in the article where it's like mm -hmm. showing multiple cameras simultaneously and you start to get a slightly bigger picture of what was going on the the members of the public who spotted crooks it takes a it basically is about one he has one minute and 56 seconds before he fires his first shot after he's been noticed by members of the public who are right nearby him and it appears that it kind of like it looks like the security was very focused looking inward to the event mm -hmm. and it was very focused around the perimeter of, uh, you know around the nearby perimeter of the event of the event but not so um but it didn't appear to be a lot of police officers further back who were near enough to be able to respond in time. Right. That's that's the impression I'm getting. They're kind of looking more inward and less outward was the issue, well, I think, with what was going on. But There were, um, I believe there was a local police tactical team, at least, that was inside the building where it yeah. was fired How from. Embarrassing. But they were looking outside the windows of that building toward the rally site sort of like a, a counter fire or something you know what i mean if, yeah, if someone yeah, attacked the yeah. rally site um really just a perfect storm of uh just incompetence and and lack of imagination and short-sightedness and resources and re really just a perfect storm here that that yeah you know a, a millimeter no, definitely. a breeze and we would be in a very different situation today. I know, I know. I mean, Donald Trump is a very lucky man. Oh, yeah. If a bullet did strike his head, so the bullet thing is interesting. Because I, like many people, it's like, you think, would a 5.56 caliber bullet really just nick the ear or blow it off? But I've been looking, I've looked at a few videos now that have made me feel confident that he could get nicked. Um, by a bullet and it would only just damage ever so slightly damage the ear. it wouldn't kind of like knock the whole thing off depending on where it was hitting the angle thought he would have yeah i would think like if you get grazed by a 556 five, round it would take a piece of your ear off but that's, well, that's what you would think yeah. apparently so, i'm not saying he wasn't i don't no, yeah no, know enough about no, no, environmental we don't ballistics know for sure, but yeah. yeah but yeah yeah well 
Well, the last video I watched, I've watched three now, and there's still there's there's apparent there's one there's been uh, there's one I still haven't found that a lot of commentators I follow keep referencing, where apparently his whole ear gets blown off in the test, and I've not seen that one. The one I've the, the two I've seen, and, I, and I'm happy to link to them in the show notes. But one of them, they actually buy some pig's ears and stick them on a cardboard target. It sounds like a and then shoot episode. At the pig's ear. It kind of was a bit like that, but not. But it, it's sort of like a right wing myth, bu- Mythbusters, I think, because uh, they 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 use the phrase "bro science." And I was like, "Oh my god, what am I watching?" Mm, but anyway, so uh, yeah, so the two the two the two gun videos I watched, it was quite obvious the people who made these videos were into Trump. Um, mm-hmm. In one video in particular, recreated the Secret Service shooting of crooks they even recreated that for us as well but anyway so with the pig's ear thing they stapled all these pig's ears these targets and shot lots of multiple calibers at those ears at a slightly closer range they used 5.56 and some higher calibers as well and and what they showed was in fact those bullets would almost treat the ear because there's not much to it a bit like a bit of cardboard a bit of paper yeah and when you choose the paper target no matter distance you will see a perfect hole and because there isn't much resistance, the bullet will just pass through. But if it goes into somebody's main body, suddenly you get resistance. And that's yep. what creates the vacuum, which creates the big hole in the someone. bullet fractures so, and tumbles. So the, and, yeah, yeah. So the reason why Trump could have been hit by a bullet, because I've certainly seen a photograph of a bullet passing him. We've all seen that now. Yeah. It is highly possible because eight rounds were fired in his direction. So it is quite possible with a lot of luck, he just got nicked on the ear. Um, by a bullet and if he did it is physically possible for a bullet to make a very small hole contrary to popular belief that his ear might have been blown off because even i was like questioning is that even possible to survive such a thing but apparently it is so just i'm putting it out there for the for purely for um to to be open and honest uh because my initial reaction was you know i surely his ear must have got blown off and i've watched a few videos that now make me think that it is possible obviously the fbi are looking into it and it is highly possible that he could have been hit by a fragment because even victims don't always know what they've been hit by if you know what i mean Mm -hmm. because you get hit by something somebody's shooting at you you're gonna think oh i got a shot and it's totally understandable. So even Trump himself might not be aware of exactly what it was that hit well, him. His, um, Doctors should know. Yeah, Doctors his, should know. Well, that's the thing, too. His campaign has been less than mm. forthcoming with details of yeah. the medical treatment he received exactly. after this. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you would have thought, because uh, I know if it was a member of the public, he's all private and stuff, but because he's a public figure and potentially the next president of America, he's the former president of America, you would have thought there's a public interest in releasing yeah. details about the wound. Yeah, and to is, hide yeah. that strikes me as suspicious. So so I don't know. I'll keep an open mind as to exactly what hit Trump's ear. But I will reiterate, he's a very, very, very lucky man to be alive today. And maybe America dodged a bullet in itself by him not being killed because I dread to think what the reaction would have been had Donald Trump died um yeah it, it you know i dread to think because one of the videos i watched said uh i can't remember how they phrased it now but it was sort of like um they they, they said something like uh you know he got nicked yeah well his head if he moved it one direction he gets nicked on the head and he nicked and if he moved it in the other direction would get civil war is the way this gum website put it and it's like Jesus. coming from them so, that's, I don't know. that should tell you something yeah, exactly. And what was also interesting with that video, so here's the other problem with this whole scenario. So the, the, the men who made that one of these videos I watched went out and purchased both the exact model of rifle the Secret Service were using mm-hmm. and went out and easily purchased the same model of AR-15 that Thomas Crooks was using. It's the most as well. popular Mike, uh, sorry, Mac- assault rifle yeah. in the country. Yeah. And so I think the wider issue still is the um ability for people with problems because crooks clearly had some mental health problems maybe he was politically motivated and a throffing at the mouth whatever but he was still able to get hold of a military grade weapon and it was his father's gun and he went and purchased ammunition himself so it wasn't like he 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 took the gun i'm assuming his father didn't have ammunition and he went and bought some but the fact that you can go to a walmart in america and buy ammunition is an issue in itself or any shop really minimal checks so it's and and one other point that's just cropped into my head as you were speaking earlier because there's this whole thing about how he had a bicycle with him and a bomb on this bicycle with some sort of remote detonator. And I want to ask, did he drive to the event or did he take a bicycle? Because how did the gun get there if he took a bike? That's true. I, yeah. I don't have an answer I, to that one. It was a bit weird. 
I remember seeing reports from the day of the shooting that there were, you mm-hmm. know, suspicious explosive yeah. devices of some sort in his car. Yeah, because I've seen something about a bike, because there's even a photograph of a bike, but maybe maybe in the confusion there was a suspicious bike and a suspicious car, and in the end it turns out to be his car. But, right. Because the car would make more sense. Um, but it's, it's yeah, very weird, that's nonetheless. that's hard um, to... I mean, I guess yeah. you could travel with an AR-15 on a bike, but, I mean, you're going to get noticed. <laughs> it would raise an eyebrow, too, yeah. surely. Yeah, why you got that big-ass <laughs> long gun strapped to your back, wheeling down the street. Like, that's suspicious. We, yeah, yeah. Well, here's one of the other issues, Ed. With the mass availability of guns and then suddenly making it a political thing where people should open carry and carry guns everywhere. That's another thing, yeah. Suddenly, psychos don't stand out anymore because That's suddenly true. they look like a regular person. And so if you wash the whole population with firearms, when there is a bad person with a gun, it's not so easy to tell anymore. That Whilst in London, if somebody walked down the road with an AR-15, you know, <laughs> it or be, so it looked like one, they would be a... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be a national emergency, I think, but... You know, so yeah. because it would stand out like crazy. Um, and to put a record, once in the, I think it was the late 90s, a man connected to the IRA on a motorbike did, did successfully drive through London with an RPG on his back and shoot at the MI6 building and get away and never get caught. So it has happened. <laughs> I don't know that we've gotten that bad um, no. <laughs> over here yet. I don't know that you could quite do that. Um, I'm sure there's some people who wouldn't see anything wrong yeah. with it, but mm. we're not we're not we're not quite that extreme yet. No, uh, no. yeah, so we haven't gone full Afghanistan. There. No, no. And as you said earlier, obviously the L15 is one of the most popular guns in America, and sadly, it's one of the most popular guns for mass shootings mm-hmm. as well. And sort of getting into the sort of slightly icky political territory, there's been quite a few Republicans who've been wearing AR-15 pins in Congress oh. prior to the shooting. Because the AR-15 sort of become this symbol for Second Amendment advocates. And, you know, I just think it's led to this sort of stupidity around the debate of guns in America. And I would have hoped that when, you know, a, a presidential candidate gets shot at with an AR-15, it would at least bring up a healthy discussion about how maybe we should make it harder for people to be able to get access to military-grade weapons. Because I still don't really understand the need... For, to personally own an AR-15. I think having one on a gun range and all that, I can understand. But an AR-15, I don't really understand what the actual need for one is for a regular member of the public. Or even, I, I know you mentioned once before when I brought this up about if you lived in a rural area, maybe. Yeah. But an, you could have, there are different choices of weapons, like shotguns or, or um, the classic Winchester rifle or even a bolt-action rifle that could still give some of the firepower of an AR-15, but not at such a rapid succession. Um, but I don't know. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Max. I've been going on for ages now. but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you raise all valid points. The other thing that I'm thinking about in the in the aftermath of this, and of course, I mean, there'll be multiple investigations. There'll be serious investigations. We'll get to the bottom of, of what happened here. You know, I think, too, that there are, and one of these articles here talks at length about kind of the the staffing issues that the Secret Service has and how that, you know, leads to leads to these issues, right? That you just don't have the people to effectively, yeah, staff these details. I mean, the the so the Secret Service protects the president, his family, right, down to his children and grandchildren, the vice president and their family, down to their I believe they're their children, right? Their spouse and their and their children. Former presidents, their spouses and children up to the age of 16. Key members of White House staff as assigned by the president and based on the threat environment. So that would typically include the chief of staff and the national security advisor. Remember during the Obama administration, Valerie Jarrett had Secret Service protection too. That So she was um, senior advisor to the president at the time, but she had a Secret Service detail. I'm not aware of who else in the uh, in the Biden White House has Secret Service protection, right? Like as far as staff, but yeah, typically yeah. the chief of staff and and the national security advisor do. They also protect uh, the secretary of the treasury, the deputy secretary, I believe, right? Because the Secret Service was traditionally part of the Treasury Department before getting moved to DHS after 9/11 in that reorganization. They also protect the Secretary of Homeland Security and the Deputy Secretary. And that's kind of like half of what the Secret Service does. 
I don't know. I mean, there have been years of various security failures and missteps and scandals, you know, like this. One of the articles you have here mentions the um, Secret Service agents on Obama's detail during a trip to Cartagena, Colombia, were um, visiting like brothels while on the trip. You know, there were instances of, uh, I believe in, was it in 2011? Someone fired shots at the White House residence at, you know, the windows. Uh, there was another incident in 2014 where um I believe someone uh, hopped the fence and made it into the East Room of the White House, you know. Serious security failures that could be to an issue of, I don't know, you know, staffing, training. I'm not ascribing a reason why. But I, I think the rare bipartisan nature by which like Congress and, you know, everyone's like, hey, we should we, we need to take a serious look at this. I wonder if it's time for a serious rethink of what the Secret Service's fundamental mission and 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 organization look like, you know? Does it make yeah. sense? Is it the best use of taxpayer resources to have an agency that does counterfeiting cyber stuff on one side and this massive and critically important mission of protecting key government officials on the other? Like, it's just a weird... It's a weird yeah, combination that, weird. that, you know, yeah. that nowadays with the federal law enforcement infrastructure and stuff that we have, mm. you don't you don't mm. need to do it like that necessarily, you know? No, no. I mean, we thought the FBI could handle half of that and then let them focus on protection. Right. I mean, and I don't think it's going to be the, the issue of like, you know, the Secret Service is like broken up and like dissolved because I think that name at least carries a lot of history and, and oh, yeah. prestige and stuff that you would want to preserve in some way. But I, it wouldn't surprise me if this is the thing that ultimately leads to a sort of fundamental rethinking of of what the Secret Service is and what it's what it's responsible for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously, depending on which administration you get, will determine maybe how good or bad that ends up. I don't know. Yeah, um, we'll, yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, many years ago, this was yeah twenty twenty ten. I was uh, far more involved in domestic politics at that time than I am now. But I was at the um, DNC winter meeting in DC that was at the Capitol Hilton, which is on Sixteenth Street, a couple blocks up from from the White House, and that was. Um, that that winter DC got hit with like two like really big blizzards, gave it like like three feet of snow, right? So me and a group of about, I want to say like six friends probably, stayed in a hotel room at the Capitol Hill on the night before Obama was coming to speak to the DNC winter meeting. That morning, I was in the I was in the shower. So like the door closed, locked. And while I was in there, uh the Secret Service came to the room with it with it with a dog and like, you know, sniffed yeah. through the room, you know, checked everybody oh, out. Wow, went through your room while you were in the shower. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. I mean there were like my friends were in the room, in the in the hotel room. I was in the bathroom, right? So yeah, they didn't come in there while I was in the bathroom like alone, right? But it was it was weird. Like, yeah, I'm in there I'm in the bathroom with the door closed and locked and they never I I mean, I'm sure my friends were like, Oh yeah, our friends in there are getting ready. But I mean they never I remember thinking like they never came in to like check for sure that it was just yeah. me in there with, you know, something mm -hmm. that I wasn't supposed to have or shouldn't have. Right. Yeah. They never did that. Yeah. And then later that day. So we're down in one of the big like ballrooms of the hotel where Obama was speaking. We go through magnetometers and everything to get into the room. My friend then stepped out. I think he went to the bathroom or something and then came back and said to me, yeah, I just sort of like found a way back in here that I didn't have to go back through like the magnetometers and stuff into a room where Obama was going to be speaking in a couple minutes, you know? So I, I think about that and that's just like one, that's just me and one story that I have from the Secret Service like over a decade ago, right? And you you think it's yeah. sort of just, I don't know, it's it's a miracle in a way that this that th this is the first time in like 40 years that we've had a serious attempt on the life of a president or 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 a former yeah, president. It just yeah. seems like pure luck that that Trump survived and pure luck that it doesn't happen far more often. Well, yeah, I think there's a mythology around the Secret Service, i.e. the kind of the Clint Eastwood, uh, what was that film, In the Line of Fire, yeah. and many movies we've seen where there's, there's this sort of idea that the Secret Service kind of all-seeing, all-knowing, and also the... If you attempt to take the life of the president or somebody protected by the Secret Service, you're not going to walk away from it. 
No. And maybe that mythology deters 90% of the people who might think about doing it. Mm -hmm. And then the Secret Service just have to deal with the maybe 10 to 5% of people who actually would try it. I don't know. It's it, And also, there's no such thing as 100% security. No matter how much you... Th no. There's still... there are. I mean, my imagination can plant scenarios if you can get access to even heavier firepower how you could easily take on the secret service i um yeah i yeah. mean <laughs> they do their counter assault team and stuff they do they do train for that for a much more serious threat where of course you know the the detail would sort of break off and and get the principal off the x while the counter assault team would stay and and respond to the threat you know i mean if if the secret service had had it their way the president would live in a bunker under camp david or mount weather mm. right and just never leave yeah. that's that's yeah. a full proof be like the that, pope right exactly yeah. yeah but that's not that's not the way you campaign. That's not the way you, you you run the country, you know? So it's, um, I mean, it, it's an incredibly different mission. They have the amount of people that they are supposed to protect. And you consider it with the environment, like, okay, let's say you have the responsibility to protect, you know, the president's children. Consider the threat environment against, say, Hunter Biden as compared to, I don't know, um, one of Gerald Ford's kids, right? Mm. Radically different. Mm. In terms of the media attention, the sort of political spotlight and and animosity focused on Hunter Biden for, you know, good reasons or yeah. bad, not going there. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, requires a lot more resources to protect just one of the president's children. Yeah, yeah. And then people like Nancy Pelosi, her husband was attacked in what was a politically motivated attack by right. a man with a hammer. And he had zero protection, I believe. Yeah. Um, well, that's I the Capitol wrong, Police that would have um that yeah, would have yeah. that would have been responsible for for that. But mm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's true of Congress too. Just the, just the insane threat environment that they're mm. dealing with, and there mm. just aren't there just aren't the bodies and the and the dollars to to deal with it effectively. It's a real problem that we're yeah. having. No, it's not. Yeah, it's not going to be easy no yeah. matter what happens. And and with the kind of contentious political environment that we're now in. And yeah, I was going to just say something a little bit about that. I mean, you know, like we'd mentioned earlier, these AR-15 pins that MAGA Republicans were wearing. I mean, I hate to say it, but since about 2015, Trump himself has significantly contributed to the very divisive political environment that's leading to this political violence that we're starting to see. And I found it a bit rich when a lot of uh, MAGA Republicans were turning around and blaming everything on leftist rhetoric, when really leftist rhetoric is not... I, I mean, personally, I've not seen any mainstream leftist rhetoric that's violent. There are fringe elements who are nut jobs. But they're not the mainstream Democrats. I've never seen a mainstream Democratic candidate in any way, um, you know, use a weapon in a political video. Uh, I like there's some video, I think it's from, I can't remember which candidates it was now, but it's a MAGA Republican who used an AR-15 to shoot at a car and they named the car socialism. I mean, there's I've been never a, seen a Democrat There's been that. a number of those kind of ads, you know, that, that use yeah. an AR-15 for yeah. a prop that shoot yeah. at, you know whatever yeah, there was yeah, a another yeah, um, republican yeah. senate candidate i believe in missouri who had an mm. ad with like a SWAT team breaking into a house to you know like go after oh, the rhinos yes. or whatever you know yeah so yeah, yeah it's like i never so thought I just, the lepers would eat my face yeah no no so right. it's and, and trump himself's been very callous in his comments about political violence he mocks nancy pelosi's husband who was that who was a victim of a politically inspired hammer attack he suggested that followers of the Second Amendment could use their guns to stop Hillary Clinton's gun reform campaign, uh, gun reforms at a campaign rally in 2016. And apparently a group called Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, uh, known as CREW, um, they're a watchdog organization. They looked at 13,000 messages published by Trump on his Truth Social platform and found him vowing for revenge, retaliation, and retribution against his foes. So Trump does like to use violent language, yeah. and I don't want to victim blame, but he has certainly helped contribute to the environment that potentially led to a man trying to shoot at him. So it's... yeah. yeah. Jacob and I... Not good. Jacob and I mm. talked about Crooks' potential mm. motives if... If we'll ever be able yeah. to fully to fully pick them apart, I mean the only the only data point that suggests Crooks was motivated by you know left wing agitation, whatever you want to call it, against Trump is the nature of the target of who he shot at. Right, that's the only data point that suggests that at all. I mean, he was a he was a registered Republican that 
doesn't necessarily mean anything concrete either way, but it's also a data point against that he was motivated by, you know, the left. I find it very interesting that there's no manifesto, you know, like if you consider, okay, if he saw himself as uh, saving the world from Trump, from a, from a second Trump presidency or something, right? You would think he would leave some kind of a statement behind and there's none of that. You know, I think it's entirely possible and probably even likely at this point that he was another disturbed young man with access to weapons of war who wanted to go out in a blaze of glory with notoriety. I mean, it's entirely likely that if he had reached this point in October when schools were in session, he would have gone and shot up his old high school. Or if, let's say, if Biden was coming to a a rally in his area on that same day, he would have tried to take a shot Mm -hmm. at him. You know, Mm -hmm. I think he... I think it's probably likely that he was, yeah, disturbed, wanted to go out in a blaze of glory, take out a nationally important figure. And there was Trump coming to his area on that day. And he he took the shot. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I I suspect you'll be bright in that analysis there. Um, You know, it would be just this big mystery, a bit like the Las Vegas shooter. Um, Yeah. But we'll see. We will see. But I, I mean... With the Las Vegas shoes, there still is quite a lot of tangential evidence to suggest he was motivated by conspiracy theories, but there's still nothing completely 100% solid on that. But mm-hmm. uh, but there we go. Well, shall we move on just to our last bit? We don't need to spend too much on it, but about yeah. um, Biden stepping down from the presidential campaign, because that was a huge, huge thing there. Yes. So again, as surely listeners all know, unless they were, <laughs> I don't know, in, you know, an, an island for the last couple of weeks, in which case... Good for you. You had the right idea. Yes. But so here's some <laughs> here's some couple notes on Kamala Harris's foreign policy and what a potential um, administration could look like. We also have in here um, an opinion piece by Michael Weiss again that talks to his sort of thoughts on the month of Sturm and Drang of will he, won't he drop out of the race, which I think is pretty um, interesting. Anyway, we can expect uh, Kamala Harris to largely continue Biden's foreign policies. Uh, This includes strong support for Ukraine, building alliances to counter China in the Asia Pacific, and maintaining support for Israel and other Arab allies in the Middle East. There's also some indication. So her national security advisor is Philip Gordon, who You know, assuming, Mm. uh, saying, you know, for the sake of conversation, if she wins, Philip Gordon would probably be her national security advisor, is a bit more less iterative in how they sort of approach these issues. So rather than the kind of tortured process of, will we, won't we give F-16s to Ukraine? Will we, won't we give them Abram tanks or attack them with missiles or something? They, he seems to be more like, yeah, let's just do it, which... You know, there's pros and cons to that, but that sort of seems to be more how he's how he's um, inclined. Uh, however, Harris has shown a more sympathetic stance toward Palestinians. This could lead to a shift in how the U.S. handles the Israel-Hamas conflict should the war continue into her uh, administration, if there is one. Um, her statement yesterday after meeting Netanyahu sounded a bit more forceful in her criticisms than Biden. It seems Netanyahu noticed yeah. that in the statement he put out after her statement following the meeting. Um, Of course, unlike Biden, Harris hasn't known Netanyahu for 40 years, so there aren't those sort of like personal uh, history complications. Interestingly, as a senator, Harris had a track record of being more hawkish compared to Biden and speaking out against authoritarian impulses from foreign leaders like Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, Modi in India, and Erdogan in Turkey, which could present some diplomatic challenges, you know, trying to thread the needle between maintaining those alliances while also, you know, speaking out in favor of like, you know, democracy and stuff. When it comes to China, Harris is expected to maintain Biden's stance. She's advocated for reducing economic dependence on Beijing, supporting human rights in Hong Kong and uh, Xinjiang, Mm. and reinforcing Taiwan's self-defense. Lastly, Harris has consistently focused on human rights throughout her career. She opposed Trump's approaches to North Korea and Myanmar and has been vocal about the rights of the Kashmiri diaspora in India, which could be potentially interesting. It's worth noting that Harris came into the vice presidency with limited foreign policy experience. So she was, of course, originally a um, district attorney in the San Francisco Bay Area. She was the attorney general of California. She was a senator from California before becoming uh, Biden's um, vice president. She's relied heavily on a team of advisors who are traditionalists and internationalists, similar to those who served under Clinton and Obama. So sort of the, in broad strokes, the same sort of center left 
a lot of the same people actually that have been mm-hmm. around through uh, since Obama, who would who would be in that uh, administration. Not a radical change from Biden at all if she's elected. Yeah, well, like many, I'm uh, when President Biden announced he was going to step down from the race, I was a bit surprised because um, just days before I'd seen some uh, information out saying that it was the opposite, um, and uh, you know, obviously, I've seen the pressure on him. Uh, for many weeks building um and so yeah so whether or not this will be seen as a a massively positive thing or a big political mistake i think only time will tell um uh, personally i think kamala harris vice president kamala harris seems like a good choice and a logical choice to take over from biden um and it's good to see that she's got largely the backing of the democratic party oh, yeah. obviously officially she's not the candidate right now even obama this morning has just um announced that he backs her because he'd been a bit cautious before but he he announced he now backs her she is the yeah um, she is the presumptive mm. nominee she has in the first i think it was 36 hours after biden dropped out she secured the necessary pledges from delegates to 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 get the nominations yeah. but um she she is mm, a presumptive mm. nominee she has a delegates yeah and it's good to see obviously she's committed to the nato alliance which again there's a question mark with trump about that um she's committed to supporting ukraine which is good and as you mentioned it looks like she's going to take a more critical line in support of israel but not to the point where they break diplomatic ties or relation or the relationship with Israel. Because I, I, I still think that the relationship with Israel is important, mm-hmm. but I don't think it should be a card for the Israeli government to be able to do whatever they want carte blanche. And yeah, I, I think agree. this is one of the contentious issues right now. And I think um and I I'm gonna say that I think Netanyahu would rather have a Trump administration. Absolutely. I think he's gonna do everything he can to keep this situation going all the way through the um, presidential campaign. And, you know, the more of a mess it is, the more it will deter people to vote Democrat or and maybe go to a third party. I'd, I'd be surprised if anybody who is Democratic-leaning, who's pissed off with the Democrats over their handling of Israel and Gaza, um, would go to Trump, but they might move to a third party um and or just not vote and i think that's the issue um you know and i think this is where america is quite vulnerable sometimes it does seem to be quite easy to manipulate people's voting behavior or just to not vote um over you know minor you know what i would say is singular issues not minor issues singular issues and i think that's a bit of a a weakness a little bit um in the american public there uh but that's just me speaking openly right. um you know, and and so yeah, so I think uh, so I think Harris is a very capable candidate, and I and I've certainly seen on a surface level there's been a lot of energy towards her since, and a lot more energy in the political in this race. I think because uh, I think Biden now it's sort of night and day between her and Biden. I think from an energy point of view and the way people are enthusiastic about her, but again, that's the base who are enthusiastic. I don't know how that translates across the whole of America. But I have been, I will just mention Alan Lickman. I've been, this whole year, I've been following this man called Alan Lickman who has the 13 keys to the White House. Um, And he just did an update on the keys yesterday. So prior to um, Biden stepping down, Biden had... Do you want to say what the, what his keys are, what his his track record? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, Alan Lickman's successfully um, predicted each president for the last 40 years and he famously predicted trump would win in 2016 when all the polls were saying it was going to be hillary clinton and he's not using polling data he has these sort of 13 keys that are based on an academic study he did and there's yeah so i'll quickly go through what the keys are i'm not going to go into the whole process of how alan lickman makes these judgments because that's for alan lickman to say but the keys are so the first key is midterm gains the second key is no primary contest the third is being in, an incumbent seeking re-election. The fourth key is no third-party competition. The fifth key is a strong short-term economy. The sixth key is a strong long-term economy. The seventh is a major policy change. Number eight is no social unrest. Key number nine is no scandal. Key number 10 is no foreign or military failure. Key number 11 is a major foreign or military success. Key 12 is a charismatic incumbent, and key 13 is an uncharismatic challenger. So as it stands to Alan Lickman, 
Uh, obviously, Biden had more keys because he was the incumbent. And so the Democrats have lost the incumbent key now. Now, they currently have one, two, three, four, five, six keys they've got solidly in their favor, but they need eight to win the White House. And there are two keys that are very likely for the Democrats to win, but they're the ones that are the risky keys for Harris. So the risky keys are third party competition, which is key number four. And social unrest is key number eight. Those are the two that are a light blue at the moment. They're looking good for Harris. But if those two keys change to red, then Trump will win, according to Anna Lickman. I don't know what would cause yeah. political unrest to the extent that Lickman says would yeah. be needed. I don't see. I mean, unless something like George Floyd happens or whatever. He said it needs to be 1968 level. Yeah. I just don't know what would what would possibly cause that mm. unless again something happens completely unexpected that changes things i can't see what yeah. would, what would cause that at this point and the third party issue uh, rfk jr is, and he's all over the place yeah he's all over the place he's arguably drawing more people mm. away from trump than he is biden uh, the, sorry yeah. than than he yeah. is harris um at this point especially now with the um People, at least, you know, the base of the Democratic Party are incredibly excited about Harris, at least, you know, for yeah. now. Oh, yeah. Massively. Massively. There's, it's been great to see it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like hundreds of thousands of. Yeah. Last night there was a Zoom. My, my mom was on the Zoom call, actually, like an organizing call for Harris. It was the largest Zoom oh, in history. Yes. I think 140 ish yeah. or whatever thousand people on yeah. it. Yeah. And they made, raised a few million, didn't they? They raised oh, a few good. million. Then they raised over 100 million in the first 24 hours after. You know, yeah. she 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 yeah. took over the ticket. Yeah, the polls yeah. are tightening. They're within the margin of error in in a lot of places now. Really, just kind of fundamentally changed changed the race. And you know what I what I like to talk about as far as our elections and domestic stuff is you know what foreign what questions foreign listeners would would have or what or what they would be asking um, to know. But you know, it's uh, I don't know. The the vibes here have been have been very different in the last week. Um, I don't know if that will change. You know, there's been question. You know, is this like a sugar high yeah. or what? I don't. I don't know. It's been really kind of stunning the speed with which she consolidated support behind her. Yeah, indeed. Well, if we if the keys are to be believed, is a fifty fifty chance currently that Harris will win or Trump will win. Trump needs one more key to win, and Harris needs to lose at least one key if not to yeah to lose so um so yeah and she needs to basically completely get the t um key number 4 and number 8 on her side which she's half got now as it is so um we will see um Alan Lickman's been right for 40 years this could be the first one he's wrong who knows <laughs> because the question I have, which I haven't asked him yet, was I think I, my feeling a little bit is the problem is we're in a space now where people are not all thinking the same thing anymore and responding to the same information that they once were. I think the dominance of mainstream media is long gone. And I think since 2016 and in, in the world of, and we've grown into a world of personal truths, etc. I do wonder whether the criteria for judging the keys um, takes all that into account, but we'll see. Um, that's for Alan Lickman to answer, not me. And the other, cla the other unfortunate thing. So yes, youth. Hopefully, you know, youth enthusiasm towards Harris seems to be higher than it was to to Biden. But the oh, problem is night and day, as always. Right now, at least and, night and day. Yeah, yeah, and and the problem is youth voter turnout is the most unreliable in America, as it is in Britain. Um, like famously, for all the people who were pro Jeremy Corbyn, which was mainly young people, very few of them actually went and did a vote yeah if they did they might have got who they well i don't know depends where they were uh in our system but um you know it, it, but the problem is like if you don't vote for the candidate you want then you have to you know then basically that's a vote away from who you want and you will bear some responsibility they don't get in and, and young people need to be a bit more politically engaged with the actual political systems that are in place because there's a lot of politically engaged people out there but it, but they're in a kind of weird um, cycle where it leads to actual little uh, political action. It leads to a lot of protests, leads to a lot of like sounding off on the internet, etc. And a lot of positive things, but it doesn't lead to actual tangible action that results in your candidate winning. And I think this is the problem that somehow needs to be solved. But then there are West Wing episodes from the 90s where they had to organise like... Um, 
rock the vote etc and yeah. all these sort of things this has been an ongoing problem this is not just a problem for now and I, and I feel like an old man for bringing this up you know but it's it's just it is a thing um, and in fact there are people in my generation I'm in my uh, early th- well I'm 43 am I still early 40s I think I'm not quite You're 40, 40, 43 I? is early 40s I would say yeah cool I'm still just early 40s yeah <laughs> that will change soon um but but so there are people in my age category who don't vote and never have voted because they've got this weird apathetic view um especially on the it's mainly people on the left who suffer from this um have this weird apathetic view and seem to un- misunderstand the whole point of voting and some people think it's like a really right-wing thing to do and i'm like what the fuck is that about yeah so so yeah there's there's some very bizarre things that, and, I, and i was saying to people if people think voting doesn't matter if anybody's telling you voting doesn't matter they're either lying to you or they're misinformed because voting does matter and people need to get out there and exercise the democratic right because there are people out there right now working to take it away from you. And once it's gone, it's going to be very hard to get it back and you will feel the difference. So there we are. <laughs> yeah, well said. Well, I mean, yeah. there's a there's 100 days left to the election as of as of yeah. today. We shall... We shall see. The situation seems to be very different than it was, you know, even a week ago. Yeah, we will see. I feel I feel very hopeful for you guys in the States. I, I hope, you know, I, I hope um, if I hope there isn't a messy primary now, because this is the other thing that could mess everything up. There won't be. A, no, no. So there won't yeah, be. So I'm hoping I'm hoping it will. Yeah. Yeah. Be a relatively smooth um, transition and we'll see. And I would like to, you know, like all the press, negative press biden got about his age and his long-term kind of issue for gaffes which has been turned into this oh he's got alzheimer's nonsense you know i would like to see that thrown at trump now because if you ever watch a trump speech he is all over the place and there's been a big political well sorry there's been a big uh media silence on people talking about what the substance of what trump says or lack of substance um, and instead, they just selectively pull quotes to make him appear more of a presidential candidate than he actually is. And I think it, maybe this might flip it all around, and suddenly he will be exposed for being the seventy-year-old man, seventy-eight-year-old man with issues that he is. So we'll see. We shall <laughs> see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there we are. Yeah. Well, look, I think we probably should move to extra shots, shouldn't we? Yeah. This is our teeth removed or well, tooth removed. So. Yes. <laughs> this is our this is our last one for the until until September. At least, yeah, this is it till September. So we 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 ta- we will be taking a production break from extra shot and espresso martini. Um, there are three episodes still to come out over August that I've recorded, and and uh, Matt, we should probably chat about if you want to record one as well. But um, so that you won't be totally left alone over August. But we are officially sort of taking our production break over August. Um, and I'm I'm going to be away at some Buddhist uh, retreat, filming people in silence for a few, for a week, which would be interesting. And providing no catastrophic event happens, um, you should not be hearing from us on extra shot or espresso martini until September. Yeah, and I think our plan is still to stick with the second uh, Saturday and fourth Saturday of the month as our transmission date. I think that for now that that works and we're hopefully going to start transitioning to video so you'll be able to start seeing us do this on YouTube if you want to see us doing it. I still... <laughs> I'm still not sure we're the most exciting people to actually physically watch whilst doing this, but um, we will we will see. Maybe but, hey, if if you want to watch us, you go ahead. Maybe um, we're going to make make do our best to make it look good at least. <laughs> yeah. Whether whether you think we're great on camera or not is another matter. But um, but there we go. But yeah, so uh, if you want to stay with us for one more show, then join us on Extra Shot. On Extra Shot, we will be covering a developing spy case in Australia, tech bro legarks courting Trump influences driving extreme misogyny and a former u.s analyst accusing of spying for south korea so if you want to get access to extra shot you will need to be a patreon subscriber just look at the show notes now and you'll see a link to the episode in your show notes click on that and it will take you through and depending on which level you pick you'll either get a secrets and spies cup or set of coasters so thank you for your support if you do join us on extra shot If you don't, I hope you enjoyed the show. Have a wonderful summer break. Have a wonderful weekend. Please stay safe. And we will catch you in September. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.